the 2017 Toyota Land Cruiser, a nameplate that probably should be its own brand at this point because it's been around for over 60 years. Let's take a look. In the spring, I was in the Lexus LX570, the twin brother to this, except it was all tarted up. Now, this vehicle is about $86,000 as equipped, whereas the Lexus was in the 90s. And I think, well, you get a few more bells and whistles on the Lexus, but overall, this vehicle looks far less offensive. The styling looks more natural. It's not as like in your face. And it, I guess it depends on what type of person you are, if you're gonna like that or not, but this just has this clean classic Toyota look to it. Now this Land Cruiser, it's a truck. It's body on frame, it's old school. This architecture has been around forever. It's been finessed, finagled. Depending on your country, it might have a different name, but it's the same game. And one of the reasons why this has such a rabid following is it just works. They've perfected it about as much as a modern vehicle can be perfected. When I bought my Toto toilet, I thought I wanted something that I could sit on, I could kill, I could flush small animals down, golf balls, and it was gonna work day in and day out. And I was gonna have no drama because it's a functional piece of appliance work. That is exactly what the Toyota Land Cruiser is about. You can take it off road, it is set up to just go through the apocalypse. And I think if you're somebody that wants that type of vehicle, you're in rugged terrain and you're really gonna utilize this, you're not gonna give a second thought to it. You're gonna get in it and enjoy it. Now let's get real. What does your $85,000 get you? Well, obviously you're gonna tow with this. If you're not towing with it, well, then you can haul with it. And what are you gonna haul? Well, you have this split lift gate, all manual, no electronic crap, Again, back to my point earlier. The lift gate falls down like a pickup truck. You have this little lip, you can sit on it, you can dance on it, you can do, like I'm a gymnast, so I do my gymnastics on it, and you have this little tether that holds it all together. Now, when you go to lower these rear seats, uh, you know, the, the third row back here, and I said this about the Lexus, it's extremely strange the way that the third row works. And it's like, it's there, but I almost would just take it out. Uh, but then again, if you need the third row, you have it. In the Land Cruiser, it is not electronic, the release for the seats like it was in the LX570. So you have a manual release where you pull these down yourself and then you can pop up the seat through this tether, which is also magnetic. And then when you uh, release it again, you can just pop it back up. It has a, uh, a shock absorber, a strut, or whatever you want, a tension device that pulls it back up and then you snap it back into place. It's pretty usable. Your second row kind of folds down as well, and you can finagle those seats to fit more cargo in here. This, this is just a big vehicle. Most people can fill it full of so much crap, you can literally live out of here. All right, when you and your buddy Ronaldo get in here, all right, the running boards. Typically, I like them because you need it to get in here. If you're a really short person, this is going to be something else to try to get in here. But the running board width is pretty narrow. If you're somebody with a big ass foot, which I don't have, uh, it's hard in, and you got to be careful. You almost have to put your foot on straight, not to the side or you'll slip off. So just be aware of that. On the inside, I really like this interior space. I mean, Toyota obviously has spent a lot of work in here. There's a good diversity of materials. Yeah, there's some piano gloss black plastic, which I hate, but for the most part, they have really nice textured silver plastics. The gauge cluster has this aluminum look finish to it. It just, it's a little bit of old school with a modernism in it, and it's just all functional. There's very little just nonsense or garbage in here to, you know, screw up the interior space. Now I'm not one for gimmicks, but I'll be honest, most people spending this kind of money are gonna expect a little bit of fluff. There's no HUD. Uh, the infotainment looks like it's from 1992. The graphical design is totally unacceptable, and I know I've complained about this endlessly with Toyota infotainment, and I haven't brought it up in a while, but I mean, come on. This is the problem. It seems like when you outsource your design to somebody else, you literally doesn't seem like they have any control on what they're doing here. But again, there, there's still, you gotta balance the good and bad in here because most of it is really good. They have added radar cruise control, frontal crash mitigation. Some of the modern safety features are here and you even have a cooled glove box or armrest to put your drinks in, which is 
silly but also usable. Now overall the ergonomics are completely sound. All the buttons, knobs, and switches are totally usable. The HVAC controls doesn't rely on the touchscreen. Your knobs and switches all feel pretty good with the exception of the volume knob on this model. I've had it pull off on me. <laughs> it's just really loose and it feels like it's almost stripped out with the control module underneath. And you can see just how cheap the plastics are, even though that they've tried to design them like they're metal, they're just still plastic. But overall, that was really the only gripe I had. In terms of all the buttons and knobs and switches in here, they're really good. If you're choosing your four-wheel high, four-wheel low, your uh, crawl, hill descent buttons, your power ECT button, second gear start, all of that is right here, logically laid out. You're not hunting, looking around for it like a monkey. Uh, for a banana when you're in here driving and you need to activate it right away. So overall, the interior space is a really positive place, and I even like it better than the Lexus LX570 I was in. Let's take it to the shop, take a look at the suspension because there's some stuff to look at despite it being its age, and then we'll take it for a drive. I am underneath the Toyota Land Cruiser and I feel so tiny under here, but it's just indicative of what this is. It's a truck, it's a body on frame platform. And one of the big reasons why it has a 5,800 pound curb weight, it's stamped steel everywhere, cast steel. You have the, this large frame. There is literally no attempts at weight reduction. There's very few bits of aluminum here. And this is just kind of tried and true for them. I think the next generation, you'll start to see more use of aluminum to get that weight down, make it more efficient. But for now, we all know that this works and works well. There's no aerodynamic attempts to smooth out airflow. You have a big approach angle. I mean, this is just monstrous. Now in the hubs, you have uh, double wishbone suspension, large body Tokiko dampers. And when we get to the middle, you have the eight speed uh, automatic transmission and then the center differential which has a Torsen limited slip in it and it has the ability to lock up so this is obviously a true four-wheel drive vehicle. When you come to the back of the Land Cruiser you have a full-size spare and it's placed in a convenient location to change it in inclement weather or when you're all full of mud or this is full of salt and snow. The back is a four-link multi-rear suspension with a semi-floating rear axle and you have coil springs here instead of leaf springs. And that's partly why it doesn't have as much of a truckish ride. Now the big deal here, and I didn't bring it up with the LX570, is the KDDS. And what does that mean? Kinetic Dynamic Suspension System. You might be wondering, that sounds like some type of marketing fluff. It's quite a long name for basically saying this car can disconnect its own front and rear sway bars or stabilizer bars. Now the way that it works is, it's a lot simpler than you would think. It's a hydraulic system that has lines that run from the front left uh, of the stabilizer bar in the front left that has a cylinder that compresses and releases. It, the lines travel through and along the frame rail on the left-hand side of the car and then go to the left side here of the rear suspension. Now, the sway bar is always engaged on the road and because of the hydraulic forces of the suspension, it keeps the pressure in both cylinders equalized. So the sway bar is always working like a regular car. Now, in, when you start to go off road, wheel travel becomes uneven. And now the equalization effect of the hydraulic fluid and those cylinders causes the effect that this arm and that arm releases the sway bar from being under load. And it creates extra wheel travel because the sway bar is not binding up the suspension. Now the wheels can travel their full amount about 690 millimeters in the front and 650 in the back or thereabouts. So this system's really kind of creative at giving you the best kind of handling and feel on road. And then when you go off road, you really have more suspension travel, which is, it's cool and it's pretty simple. Honestly, this is not something you're really gonna have to do any maintenance on. Uh, there is a bleeder on the back so you can bleed the hydraulic fluid, but it's not something you're gonna have to do maintenance on unless you destroy one of the hydraulic lines. Believe it or not, that's it for the in the shop segment with the Toyota Land Cruiser this week. We're gonna keep it simple, but let's take this out on the road and see how it handles, if it's, whole, if it's held up to the test of time and the good and the bad of it. Taking off in the Toyota Land Cruiser. 
on smooth pavement, this is like putting a steering wheel on your couch and driving around. You know, you get in here and you think, man, I could go road tripping in it. I could be totally comfortable. Uh, the front and the rear seats are great. The overall proportions of the interior space are something else. I mean, there's just so much room to grow in here. I could eat 50 hamburgers and still have room left over to, to eat like that every single day and you would still be able to fit in this car after a couple of years. It's crazy. Um, when you get in a vehicle like this, you understand why people like it so much. Now, in terms of ride quality, when you get over brand new roads, I mean, it's like a non-issue. Now, when you go to get a little bit more dicey stuff, and I said this about the LX570, and I feel like this is better, and it's primarily because of the tires. You don't have ridiculously skinny sidewall tires on this car, and the compliance is so much better. You don't feel the micro fractures driving the Land Cruiser around like you did in that car, so it, it reduces the truckishness of the ride of this. It feels more car-based than truck in here, and I think it's a huge pro. Now, yeah, it doesn't handle like concrete surfaces that well. You can still feel like kind of the rear end jittery, being a little bit more jittery. But you know what? To complain about the ride quality in here or the smoothness of the ride is kind of silly. Now, overall road noise, uh, road isolation is pretty good. It's not the quietest interior cabin ever. And now that I'm in winter, it's a little bit more windy and you hear it but it's certainly, I wouldn't put it up there with luxury levels of refinement in terms of interior noise, but it's very quiet for what it is. Um, you're certainly not gonna have any issues with it. And most importantly, this is one of the highest mileage press cars I've been in at almost 16,000 miles. These things are run ragged. There's not one creak, not one rattle, not anything that just clicks or pops. And that's one of the most impressive things about it. Uh, it. It just really is, it feels so solid and put together. Now braking, you know, braking is a little weird because, and I know this is probably set up more for towing, but on the street I've noticed it. You get into the brake pedal a little bit and it's like nothing's happening. And you're like caught off guard by the weight transfer that it's not stopping and then you push it a little bit harder and then the brake system's like, oh, now I'm going to assist you even more. And then it's like all the power comes on and it's taken me a while to modulate the brakes. Now there's no trickery, there's no sport modes, there's no steering or throttle settings. You do have an ECT power button, which I'll engage, which allows the transmission to be a little bit more aggressive uh, and you're not gonna use this for driving hard. But in the turns, you know, this feels very big. That's what I'm talking about. The brakes are so overly sensitive. Uh, as soon as you, you get to a certain point, they're like, I'm coming on full force. And so you just have to be prepared for it for daily driving. For towing, I'm sure it's a non-issue. Now, you know, handling and turning is not what this is about. Although the body control is pretty impressive for what this is, I, I wouldn't say that you're gonna be like, driving aggressively but it seems like you hit hit this point where the suspension kind kind of settles in and it starts to grip and it's not like it doesn't give you that tip over feeling is what i'm trying to say the biggest and best thing about this vehicle is the v8 and you know this thing's 5,800 pounds. So even with the V8 in here, it's not going to blow your doors off, but there's so much torque. It sounds so good. This is that classic sound that you would expect from this. And this Toyota V8 has been almost bulletproof. I mean, you could just drive the living shit out of this thing and have no issues. It sounds really good. Again, one of the best parts. They've added the eight-speed automatic in here, which seems to shift quickly. It doesn't gear hunt. Uh, it's, it favors smoothness. It's not a herky-jerky transmission at all. It's, it's also, it's a really good combination for this motor. Now, the biggest negative here is something that I cannot tolerate driving this every day is the fuel economy sucks. My average is 13.5 miles to the gallon, and I have not been driving it hard. Every time I go to the pump, I feel like the uh, hose of the fuel filler is going to strangle me like a giant snake. 
and it it's really kills this thing in terms of you know daily driving now if you can dump 85 grand on a car you probably don't care about the fuel efficiency but you know on like my daily commute to work it's just totally unnecessary and it's one of the biggest negative parts about this Big thanks to Preparation H for supplying this couch so I can sit in comfort to give you my final thoughts on the Toyota Land Cruiser. Now, whatever you call it in your country, it's world renowned. It's world renowned for its comfort, for its reliability, durability, and ruggedness. I'm not gonna argue that, but this is one vehicle I couldn't wait to get out of. And the primary reason is in my 40 mile commute, I can't stand the fuel economy. Filling this thing up is an absolute joke. If you are just riding by yourself on a flat road, grinding to and from, it makes almost no sense. Now, if you're using it for what it's for, it's off-road capability, mountainous terrain, dirt roads, rocky and hills, and just bad inclement weather, it's a total win. If you're, you, if you're a larger group of people, you have a family, you need to pack stuff in here, you're towing and hauling, it's another big win. But the big thing for me also is the cost. At 85 grand, I feel like they need a stripped down, more utilitarian version of this that takes all the good stuff about it and packages it in more of a affordable package, basically. And you know, at 55 grand, I I recommend this all day. But you're really gonna have to think about, you know, what you're getting here. You're kind of paying a tax for the heritage of this vehicle. Now it drives good. You want to drive it all day long assuming you know the fuel economy doesn't bother you you take this on long road trips it's just it's great to drive the hvac system in the front and the back works amazing the heated and cooled seats just a lot of the amenities work really well and that's the thing you know if you're going to use it for what it's for great if you're not you might want to look somewhere else hopefully for the next generation they sort out a couple things reduce the weight fix some of the interior seating configuration issues and try to get more models out there to, to mainstream this a little bit better. But that's it. Take care.